Uh, good evening. Um, my name is uh, James Lopez. I'm a professor of Spanish here, and it's uh, a real pleasure uh, to uh, welcome you all to the University of Tampa. Uh, I especially want to thank those members of the greater community who have uh, come to see this presentation uh, with us. Um, uh, just so that you know, uh, this presentation is part of uh, a National Endowment for the Humanities uh, Summer Institute that uh, the University of Tampa uh, was able to uh, acquire for this summer. So we have 30 scholars uh, representing 15 states and Puerto Rico living here with us for a month uh, to study the fascinating history of the uh, immigrant uh, communities of Florida at the turn of the last century, the role that Jose Marti played among them, and also the role that they played in uh, the war for Cuban independence and, uh, and later the uh, U.S. intervention in that war and the um, consequences of that intervention. Um, this week, today, we start our week dedicated to the study of Jose Marti, and uh, there's no one better uh, to talk about the relationship between Jose Marti and Tampa than our keynote speaker. Um, the last three years of his life, Jose Marti came to Tampa 20 times. He loved Tampa. He called Tampa el pueblo fiel, the loyal people of Tampa. Tampa became a part of Marti, and Marti became a part of Tampa. He said once of Tampa, aquí ya todo está hecho, meaning that everything had already been done here before he even arrived. That's why we have carefully selected our speaker tonight. He knows so much about Jose Marti in Tampa, where he went, who he saw, where he slept, where he ate, where he visited, where he gave his most famous speeches, where he drafted the fundamental principles of the Cuban Revolutionary Party, who were his most trusted confidants, how he was able to convince the cigar makers of Tampa to give a day's salary to the cause of Cuban independence. Most of you know our speaker tonight is the retired Judge Emiliano Jose E.J. Salcines of the District Court of Appeals. He is a native of Tampa and the son of immigrants from Spain that came here through Cuba. He's a lawyer by profession, a, a career that spanned over 55 years. He's had a multifaceted career. Um, he was a career federal and state prosecuting attorney, elected four times by the voters of Hillsborough County, County for a total of 16 years as the state prosecuting attorney, and then he served on the appellate bench for 15 years. On top of that, he's also a noted Tampa historian and a beloved member of the community. Few others have done as much as E.J. Salcines to study, con uh, conserve, and divulge the rich history uh, of our community. Judge Sassinas has two academic degrees, including his law degree, and has two honorary doctorates. He has a weekly television documentary series on Tampa history and has published many articles on Jose Marti and Tampa's rich Latin history. He gave the keynote address some years back to the Florida Historical Society here in Tampa, titled Jose Marti in Tampa. Recently, when Dr. Eusebio Leal, the historian of Havana, Cuba, came to Tampa, it was Judge Salcines who escorted him to all the Marti sites and introduced him for his address to the Ybor City Chamber of Commerce. Tonight, we know you will learn a lot about a side of Jose Marti that you may or may not have ever heard about before. It's almost as if our speaker were at the small railroad depot not far from here, welcoming Marti to Tampa on every single one of those 20 visits. So it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce to you tonight the Honorable Emiliano Jose Salcines. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. And thank you for interrupting your schedules to come here to the University of Tampa to listen to this lecture and some of the other lectures by some very eminent scholars that have come from all over the country, all over the world, to participate in this unique conference focusing on the life and time of Jose Marti. The Jose Marti that you all, especially the professors that are here, and those that have heard the lectures before me, certainly have heard of the Jose Marti who was 
a literary giant, an individual who was a great orator, an individual who wrote essays, who was a foreign correspondent for two newspapers in New York, whose articles on the life and time of the United States were being read in Caracas, Venezuela, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And from those newspaper articles that he wrote as the foreign correspondent, other smaller newspapers would take those articles and publish them. So the name Jose Martí, in a period of five years, got well known not just among the intelligentsia of the Spanish-speaking world, but by government agents, by public officials, by people who were inspired, who wanted to know more about the life and times in the United States. When I was a young teenager, there was an individual by the name of Alistair Cook. Some of you will remember that he was the one that wrote about the United States to the English-speaking world. Before him, Alex de Tocqueville wrote about the life and times of this new nation with an idea called democracy and constitutional government. Well, in the late 1880s, a Cuban who was living in exile in New York with two academic degrees from the University of Zaragoza in Spain, letters and philosophy, a graduate in law, civil law and canon law, and he was a linguist. He spoke at least five languages. In one of the publications that I read, it appeared that he really enjoyed speaking French. That surprised me. I knew that his father, when he was a little boy, had already taken him to a school in Havana, a grammar school, so that they could teach his son how to speak English and how to do arithmetic and accounting. And then, as the boy was developing, we have a picture over at the far end there, a young boy with a medal on his lapel. He was that quality of a student. His father recognized that the boy was sharp and went to see Rafael Mendive, a most distinguished educator in high school, and said, would you accept my son? And Rafael Mendive had a great influence on this young man. Now, you've heard a tremendous amount, those of you that have been hearing the distinguished lecturers that have made presentations before me. You've heard of what a great essayist, what a great orator, that he wrote um, poetry, that he wrote essays, that he wrote uh, theatrical, he was a, a playwright, that he wrote all kinds of material and published a lot in the newspapers. Today, you're going to hear another side of this very, very illustrious individual. Today, I'm not going to be talking about what a great poet he was, what a great orator he was, because the man that came from New York the last week of November of 1891 was suffering from a great psychological depression. But before I tell you about the individual that stepped off 
of the train that Henry B. Plant had brought from New York to Tampa, two days of travel. Before I tell you that, I want to add to those of you that have lectured for the last week the things that you've said, you have convinced me that before Jose Marti came to Tampa, if the Nobel Prizes were available, which they were not, Jose Marti would certainly have been a Nobel Prize winner. If the Pulitzer Prizes were available, which they were not, Jose Marti would have enjoyed Pulitzer Prizes too for literature, for, for poetry, for history, an outstanding intellectual. And it was that intellectual that was suffering from a major depression when he received an invitation from a tiny little place called Ybor City. Ybor City with an I and not with a Y. E.J., what are you talking about? I have always seen it with a Y. That's right, but back in Valencia, Spain, where uh, Mr. Ybor was from, the same as Martí's father, who was also a Valenciano, the name in Spain is with an I. But Mr. Vicente Martínez Ibor got tired of the crackers calling him Mr. Ibor. <laughs> so after hearing Ibor and Ibor, he told his lawyer, Oye, por favor, get my name changed, put a Y, so that the Americans can pronounce Ibor. So uh, Mr. Ibor had recently moved from Key West, where he was a giant in the cigar industry, and he had come to Tampa, and he was just getting a cigar city started with a competitor, but who was a dear friend of his, by the name of Ignacio Aya. Ignacio Aya, like, uh, like Martínez Ibor, was a Spaniard. Martínez Ibor was from Valencia, and Ignacio Aya was from the northern part, the province of Santander, that we now call Cantabria. San Vicente de la Barquera and Escalante. I think he was from Escalante. In any case, little tiny Ibor City, that if you blinked, you missed it, was just getting started. It was only five years old. But the quest for Cuban independence was very much alive. And there were two clubs, so-called revolutionary clubs, in Ybor City. And they had already missed one celebration of El 10 de Octubre, the 10th of October, which is like the 4th of July for the Cuban people, as the 4th of July is to us. But another important event was coming up. And if we could have a patriotic uh, uh, event, and we could bring in a good orator, we could probably make some money selling tickets and raising money for our club. The club that I'm talking about was called the Ignacio Agramonte Club. And one of their friends and members uh, of the Ybor City Cuban community was a revolutionary himself by the name of Ramon Rubiera de Armas. And he said, 
Yo conozco un buen orador. I know a good orator. I've debated against him in New York. We don't always agree on the same tactics or strategy that should be employed, but he's a hell of a speaker. So they sent an invitation to Jose Martí, not knowing that Jose Martí was suffering from a great depression, a great deception. Just two months before that invitation came, Jose Martí's wife had clandestinely packed up and told their son, Pepito, let's go. And she left for Cuba, not telling her husband that she was leaving and taking their only child. In the meantime, the Spanish government has had information that this guy, Jose Martí, is really advocating independence. He's really creating waves, and he is serving in a diplomatic position as the consul, C-O-N-S-U-L. Some people want to pronounce it counsel or counselor. No, counsel is what I am, a lawyer. The consul is a diplomatic representative in a particular community. Certainly doesn't have the rank of an ambassador. Certainly doesn't have the rank of a consul general. But where there are foreigners, the governmental agents feel that they need someone to serve those natives of the foreign country that are in the city, and they appoint consuls. Jose Martí was the consul of three countries. Argentina, naturally, they used to read his articles in Argentina. He was a well-known newspaper writer of their newspaper, so the government appointed him as their consul, el consul en Nueva York. Uruguay, which is next to Argentina, also the beneficiary of all of these articles that Jose Martí would send to the newspaper of Buenos Aires, appointed him as their consul de Uruguay in New York. And Paraguay, just north, did the same thing. So Jose Martí had a side income, not much, but he did have a side income because he was the consul for three Latin American countries. The Spanish government would complain to the State Department of the United States, hey, this guy, you're supposed to be our friend. Spain is supposed to be a friendly nation with the United States, and this guy that you have there is advocating independence, he's stirring up the, uh, the, the troops, and he's serving as a consul. He's not supposed to be doing that. So pressures were being put on the diplomats of those three countries, and Jose Martí, with this psychological depression, resigned those three consulates. His wife is gone. He even resigned from the literary society. Almost like a guy that, the hell with life. The most important thing that I have in my life is my little Pepito, and she's taken him, and I can't go over and visit because I am persona non grata in Cuba. So, as we say in Spanish, olvídate de tu hijo. Tú no lo vas a ver más. Forget your son. 
You're never going to see him again. And then, in that depressive state, he gets an invitation from some place called Ybor City, Tampa. Tampa was not the Key West. In 1890, Key West was the largest city in Florida. You say, how can that be? The cigar industry, it was, they almost had more Cubans in Key West than they had in Cuba. They had almost more cigar factories in Key West than they had in Cuba. So Key West had become a very powerful center of Cubania. You all think of Miami today as the capital of Cuba in the United States with all their Cubans. Key West was that. And Jose Marti was not familiar with Donde queda Tampa? Where is Tampa? But he chose to accept the invitation. And they sent, I think it's $170 that it took to bring Jose Marti for four days. It took you two days to come down on the Henry B. Plant Railroad and it would take you two days to get back to New York. If you were traveling to Key West, you travel the two days to Tampa, and then the Henry B. Plant Railroad would go on another seven miles in a spur from downtown Tampa to Port Tampa. EJ, why Port Tampa? because Port Tampa had the deepest channel. So the bigger ships could come into Port Tampa and suffer no problems of the shallow waters if they came up Tampa Bay. So you could continue on Henry B. Plant's railroad and travel an extra seven miles and you would get to Port Tampa. It was also an independent city. You'd get off of the train that brought you from New York, and you would step onto a ferry like the one that I've brought you there called the Mascot. The Mascot had a sister ship called the Olivet, and they had some others, all part of the Henry Plant ferry down to Key West and then to Havana. In time, it even went to Jamaica. So Henry Plant was just not a railroad magnet. He also got into the steamship business, the ferries. The mascot is important because the seal of the city of Tampa has right in the center a ship, and underneath the ship, it says mascot. That is the mascot. Why would anybody put a ship on the seal of the city? Because in 1887, the city of Tampa became an independent city, and now they elected city councilmen and mayors, and a city councilman by the name of Martinez Ivor, the son of the Don, the father of Ibor City, got elected to city council. And when they're deciding what type of seal they're going to have for the city of Tampa, he says, I think we should have the mascot because the mascot is the one, one of the sister ships that's bringing all of these Cuban cigar makers to work and develop 
the cigar industry. So, as a result, we've got the mascot on the city seal. Now, Jose Marti not only used the mascot, but he also used the Olivet. He probably used the Hutchinson, which was just another ferry going back and forth to Key West and on to Havana and then coming back. So Jose Marti accepts the invitation and arrives in a tiny little station, not a big union station or the central station in downtown New York. It's almost a small little place that just enough for you to step off or to step on to the railroad. There was a group waiting for him and it was raining, it was midnight, and Jose Marti is escorted to the rooming house where he is going to sleep. Didn't they have a hotel, EJ? Yeah, they did. But 10 days before Marti got here, Ybor City suffered the first fire and El Hotel de la Habana burned. But the guy at the club that had said, hey, I have debated with Jose Marti in New York, and he's a great orator, Ramon Rubiera de Armas, had a rooming house. He was a lector, and he arranged a room so that Jose Marti could stay in the Ramon Rubiera de Armas rooming house and take meals, certainly breakfast, there in the Rubiera restaurant of that rooming house. In any case, the next morning, Jose Marti is taken to the factory of Vicente Martinez Ibor and then shown around tiny little Ibor City. And then he is shown Mira. Ese edificio que está ahí, that building that you see there, that's where you're going to speak tonight. This was a makeshift club from the original wooden cigar factory that had been built for Martinez Ibor. He was in Key West. He had told Gavino Gutierrez, who was laying out Ybor City and directing the construction, build me a factory. And they built a factory, okay, a wooden factory. It turned out to be too small. It was a very small factory. In the meantime, Ybor, not only Ybor City suffered the fire, but before that, there was a major fire in Key West. And Martinez Ibor factory almost burned, and his production and his supply of tobacco burned. So he quickly told his man in Tampa, no quiero más fábricas de madera. I don't want any more wood factory. Build me a brick factory. Why, of course, the brick factory is that factory where Jose Marti has the one and only photograph in Tampa. But this became El Liceo Cubano, the Cuban Lyceum, the word Lyceum, center of learning. And the Cuban Lyceum is the center of these clubs and socializing and recreation. And this is where Jose Marti gives his two speeches. The day of the, the first day, uh, which is the 26th of November, and then 
the 27th, he gives his second very famous speeches. El Liceo Cubano continues serving as a recreational place, but it also becomes, during the next three and a half years, Jose Marti's unofficial office. This was his headquarters. This was such an important building that the Cuban government, when deciding what stamps could we issue in the Cuban postal system, what stamps could we have about Tampa and Jose Marti? Look at this stamp issued in 1955. Same building, but celebrating Tampa's centennial by the Cuban Post Office. If you have any copies of this stamp, save it, include it in your will, because <laughs> it's a very valuable piece. Then, if that wasn't enough, the Cuban government, on two separate occasions, issues this one. Good. Jose, stay where you are. Don't move. Oh, you have to go to the restroom? They first came out with this one, and then a few years later, they came out with this one. This one was in 2005, commemorating Jose Martin and commemorating Tampa. There is a very long and lasting relationship between Cuba and Tampa. We even have a street named Republica de Cuba. We have more statues. We have more historical markers. We have more places designated in honor of Jose Martí than we have of George Washington or of Abraham Lincoln or of John F. Kennedy. Cuba has had a very, very important role in the development of Tampa. When the historian of Havana came to Tampa about uh, four or five years ago by the name of Eusebio Leal, he asked that I tour him around and show him all about Martí. And after we had done that, I said, I'm going to take you into an area called Palmasia. That doesn't sound Cuban to me, Jay. Wait. As soon as we, pa we were on MacDill Avenue, as soon as we passed Morrison, I told him, look at the street signs. And as we got closer to the Palmasia Golf and Country Club, he started seeing all of these Spanish street names. San Rafael, San Miguel, San Nicolás, Empedrado, Tacón. He turns around and he says, these street names are the streets of my Habana Vieja. And I said, absolutely right. And then I told him this. The history of Tampa cannot be written without many chapters about Cuba and the Cubans. But your history, the history of Cuba, cannot be written without at least some short chapters about Tampa. We are connected for the last 500 years. So Jose Martí gives 
two of his most famous speeches in El Liceo Cubano, he is introduced to white Cubans, mulatto Cubans, and Afro-Cubans. Before you know it, he's getting along with all of them. And he starts his persuasions. He starts convincing them that even though some want autonomy, others want an association with the United States, some want no government at all, whatever variety of governments they want, Jose Marti convinces them, look, we all agree that Cuba should be an independent nation. Jose Marti is so moved by what he found in Tampa that as the professor said in the introduction, aquí ya todo está hecho. Everything is already organized here. He was, he was taken to the cigar factories and one author says, Jose Marti had heard about lectores, but he had never actually been in a cigar factory where there was a lector. And so he writes, in Tampa, the workers are getting educated while they are earning a living. And then those lectores become very important in the message of Jose Marti because they had brought in a stenographer from Key West by the name of Gonzalez. His picture is right here. This gentleman with the big mustache way at the end is the famous stenographer who took the two speeches. They say that he broke four pencils trying to capture the words that Marti was saying, because Marti spoke very fast. He was very eloquent, eloquent. And this man captured most of the speeches. And as soon as the speech was over, he would go with Ramon Rivero y Rivero, who had introduced Jose Marti both days to his printing office. And they quickly typed up the first speech. Quick, go to the railroad station. The train is about to come by, load up copies of the speech. It's going over to Port Tampa. Make sure it gets on the ferry so that tomorrow morning it gets delivered in Key West and they can read it in the cigar factories of Key West, which had many, many factories. They can read the speeches to the workers of Key West. The same thing happened the next night. To the boat, another boat. Get it down to Key West. So we can say that in a four-day period, the speeches given by Jose Marti in the Liceo Cubano were already being heard in Key West, the largest city in Florida. Probably copies were going up to a little community called Ocala that now had at least one and maybe two cigar factories. And then maybe over to Jacksonville. Jacksonville was the second largest city in Florida because it was the center of the railroads. And it was right next to Fernandina and uh, Amelia Island that had a very deep entrance in the port. Big ships could come in. 
So the word got around. There was no TV, there was no radio, but the word got out about Jose Marti. He leaves. The revolutionaries, the militants of Key West were so impressed with this Pico de Oro, very fine orator, that they tell Jose Dolores Pollo, his great, great grandfather, Dolores Pollo, oye, comunícate con Jose Martí, convéncelo, hay que traerlo a Cayo Hueso. And his great, great grandfather sends an invitation to New York and Jose Marti accepts. And the second visit that we have of Jose Marti is on Christmas Eve, the same year. One month later, he comes to Tampa from New York on his way to Key West. And in Key West, as he arrives, he says he embraces the old warriors. And they respond with the words of what he had given in Tampa, a great speech, the second night. Los Pinos Nuevos, the young pines, the new pines, the young revolutionaries. So the old embraces the new. And then I want to introduce you to him. I want to introduce you to him. I want to take you to that factory. I want to take you to that chinchal, which is a small cigar factory. I want to take you there. I want to take you there. And Jose Martí spends a good week there in Key West, meeting the real heavy warriors of the Ten Year War. Even some that had participated in a very short war called La Guerra Chiquita, which had not lasted long. But here Jose Martí is actually conversing. Why do you think you lost the Ten Year War? Why did you all lose La Guerra Chiquita? What would you do differently if we started the war now? So little by little, this intellectual in letters in humanities from the University of Zaragoza starts getting bombarded with military science and tactics. We, we have to do this, we can't do this because that port, we can't do this because the Spaniards are always watching here. And all of a sudden, Jose Martí is learning more and more, and he is becoming an encyclopedia. We call in computer language a spreadsheet of all different sections what went wrong? What went right? Who led here? Who surrendered here? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? So Jose Martí now is starting to really blossom in an area that he had never studied before. And that is, how do I raise money? How do I raise big money? Where do I buy the Remingtons? And where do I buy the bullets? Where do I buy the, the knives? Where do I buy the revolvers? Where do I buy horses? Where do I buy medicines? How do I get all of my supplies from this country to that country? And then he realizes that the only way he can do that, one, is to have internal support inside Cuba. They must want independence. There must be warriors inside. And I'll take care of recruiting the outside. And I'll take care of raising the money. 
and then we will start a filibustering, not the ones that we have in Washington. Filibustering is a term of expeditions where you hire a ship, a boat, you load it up with men and supplies, and you cross the Florida Channel, and you invade Cuba. Do you invade it on the east? Do you invade it on the west? Do you invite it only on the north side? Or can we come through the south and come in from the bottom? All of those things Jose Marti sought guidance from experienced guerreros, the old timers. In any case, Jose Marti then is invited and he comes back. Note that in July he arrives in Ybor City and he leaves down to Key West again through Port Tampa. In the meantime, there are letters, communications, telegrams going back and forth. July the 17th, Jose Marti returns from Key West and this is the time that he brings Serafin Sanchez, a general who had warred, who had done battle in Cuba, who enjoyed a great reputation, and came with his great great grandfather, Jose Dolores Pollo, and the mayor of Tampa, Herman Glogowski an immigrant from Germany is now the mayor of Tampa and he says I want to invite these distinguished guests to come with me. So Glogowski, we've got the only picture that Tampa has of Glogowski. Glogowski invites the delegation headed by Marti to come to the mayor's office and escorts them to his mayor's horse-drawn coach and they cross the new Lafayette Bridge in the handout you will see a picture of what is now the University of Tampa. And you see the original Lafayette Bridge. So Glogowski invites these guests to come along, brings them to what is now the University of Tampa, the famous Tampa Bay Hotel and literally walks them through all of that beautiful exotic hotel. Then they leave and Jose Marti takes his guests to the north and they go on to Ocala and there was a section of Ocala that was developing as a cigar town called Marti City. He then goes on to Jacksonville and from Jacksonville they travel to St. Augustine on a pilgrimage because one of the great thinkers in Cuban life and history was Father Felix Varela. The US postal system many years ago, about 20 years ago, issued a stamp in honor of that illustrious Cuban who had been a priest in New York, who had catered to the immigrants and had returned to St. Augustine where his uncle had been one of the Spanish governors. And it is there that Felix Varela died and Jose Marti and the Cuban delegation that was with him 
when to render honor and homage to El Padre Félix Varela. You'll be pleased to know that years later, around 1910-1911, Fernando Figueredo Socarras, who had become mayor of West Tampa and now was the treasurer of the Republic of Cuba, when Cuba was an independent nation, and he had brought up a Navy ship. They had exhumed the remains of Father Felix Varela and taken Father Varela's remains to Havana, and whenever you visit the University of Havana, you will go to the large classroom, El Aula Magna, and there you will have the remains of that great intellectual called Father Felix Varela. After they left St. Augustine, returned to New York. Then Jose Marti returns to Ybor City November the 8th, and then on to Key West. He had really stimulated the leadership, the militants of Key West. They were now organizing. They were now starting to raise money. Then he comes back from Key West and then left on to New York. But then again, December the 9th, Jose Marti arrived in Ybor City, left on December 14 for Ocala, where he is the best man in the first Cuban wedding in Ocala. But before going to Ocala, a great picture is taken in front of the factory of Martinez Ibor, which is that one there. So that picture is 1892, not like the marker that says 1893. It's 1892 when that picture was taken. Your great-grandfather is in that picture, and um, Serafin Sanchez is in that picture, Candao and maybe the um, maybe the Carbonell family is in that. I've only been able to read different uh, accounts and only come up with about five names of that historic picture. In any case, we are now in December. And it's the 16th of December. And Martí arrived from Ocala and stayed in a rented bungalow. More than likely, the bungalow had been rented by a warrior by the name of Carlos Ruloff, who was, I think, from Poland or Russia. And he had uh, adopted Cuba and he participated in the wars of Cuban independence. In any case, Martí is visited by two Cubans who invite him to have a glass of wine with them. And when he tastes the wine, he quickly feels something is wrong with this wine and spits it out. The two would-be assassins immediately fled, and they summoned Dr. Barbarossa, Eduardo Barbarossa, to come help Martí. And they transport him from the bungalow to the Pedroso home. That is the first reference we had to Paulina and Ruperto Pedroso's home and they assume the, the housing and protection of Martí. Dr. Barbarossa washes out his stomach, and after a few days of convalescence, he is able to leave on the 22nd of December. Gets to New York 
in time for Christmas and in time for New Year. And then in January, it's another birthday. He doesn't realize his time now is very limited. And he returns in 1893, February 21, having stopped in Savannah and Fernandina Beach. He is already anticipating some expedition, some filibuster that's going to have to carry men and supplies to Cuba. Again, why Fernandina? Because it has a very deep channel. So heavy boats, tugboats, big yachts, big commercial cargo ships can come in and go. From there, he comes down to Tampa and goes on back to Key West. Then on March the 2nd, he arrives in Tampa and leaves for Marti City in Ocala early in the morning. In the meantime, he is visiting all the different cigar factories. He is becoming familiar with who are the deep pocket, who are those cigar manufacturers who are willing to dig deep into their pockets to give or even to lend money to the Cuban cause of independence. We then pass And now you have the continuation of Marti's visits. The next one is in 1894. January 12, he arrives in Ybor City with Bernardo, who is the son of the man that has become the most trusted person of Martí in Key West called Fernando Figueredo Socarras, an important person and an important name for you to remember. Because Fernando Figueredo Socarras is the first Cuban American to get elected to the House of Representatives in Tallahassee, representing um, Monroe County. After being the state representative, he then becomes the school superintendent in Key West. He had been an engineering student in New York just before the Ten Year War started in 1868. Those of you that are visiting tonight, the Ten Year War started in 1868 and lasted to 1878. 1868 is three years after our Civil War ended in this country. Those of you of the South certainly would hear it not as the Civil War, but as the War of Northern Aggression. So the war between the states had ended three years before the 10-year war started in Cuba. Then we have the, uh, the son of Fernando Figueredo Socarras traveling with him and then took young Bernardo Figueredo to meet Tomás Estrada Palma, who is the leading political figure, a school teacher who had become an American citizen in a small community very close to West Point in the state of New York. He had been the president of Cuba at the tail end of that 10-year war, was living in New York, 
and the Cubans all look to Tomas Estrada Palma as the maximum representative of the Cuban government, if not in arms, in exile. In May, Martí arrives in Ybor City with the son of Máximo Gómez. Máximo Gómez had been the supreme commander of the military forces for Cuban independence. Was he a Cuban? No. He was from Dominican Republic, but he had dedicated himself to the cause of Cuban independence. And his son, Panchito, Frankie, had come with José Martí. He's an important figure to remember because his father is the supreme commander. In other words, he is the Eisenhower of the European theater in the Second World War. But this is the one that's going to lead all of the troops, all of the expeditionary forces, all of those foreign soldiers that are coming to fight for Cuban independence, of which there were many. And Panchito dies a year after José Martí died, together with Antonio Maceo, who was a very big, strong, black military leader called the Bronze Titan, and who had led many successful battles during the Ten-Year War, had all kinds of scars. And then after the Martí War started in 1895, Panchito is at the side of famous General Antonio Maceo, and they were both killed in a place uh, in the province of Havana, very close to the province of Pinal del Rio called Punta Brava in that area. It's important that you remember Panchito because he traveled with Martí to many different parts of the United States. That gave Martí a great credibility because there were a lot of old timers that really didn't know much about this young guy, the lawyer called Martí. But when they said, he's traveling with Maximo Gomez's son, immediately that was an invitation of credibility. So he traveled with Martí to many different areas. Then he brings Panchito to Tampa. Everyone noticed that this is 1894. West Tampa has just started to develop, and in 1894 they had just completed, a few months before, a bridge called the Fortune Street Bridge, not far from where we are today, that helped bring Cuban cigar um, workers over to a new area that was being developed like West Tampa. West Tampa and Ybor City. The story of two cities, except that Ybor City was never a city, West Tampa was an independent city. It got to be that West Tampa had more cigar factories than Ybor City. So Martí is introducing Panchito to all of these leading uh, individuals that are going to help the cause of independence. Martí and Panchito leave Ybor City on their way to Jacksonville. I haven't mentioned much about Jacksonville, but in the meantime, Jacksonville, by 1894, 1895, now has about 10 cigar factories. Before you know it, when the so-called Spanish-American War, which has the wrong title, it should be Spanish-Cuban-American War of Independence. By the time that that got started, 
Jacksonville already had 14 cigar factories with a growing Cuban colony that was coming through with money for the cause of independence. October the 2nd, Martí leaves Ybor City, and the next morning he is in Key West, now really moving the intelligentsia down in Key West. The war is going to start soon. We're making final arrangements. In the meantime, with the money that they're raising, they're buying guns, bullets, um, uh, rifles, they're buying um, uh, revolvers, they're buying necessary implements of war. In Spanish, pertrechos militares. They need this. They also are storing those weapons that they are buying. They're buying guns by the thousands, and they need to be stored. That becomes important in just a few more months. Martí, on October the 5th, arrives in Port Tampa from Key West and then goes on to West Tampa because, one, he can cross the Fortune Street Bridge and they have just initiated a streetcar where before they were crossing with horse and buggy. Now there was a streetcar and he went to the Fernandez O'Halloran Cigar Factory that he had already met in Key West. But they had made the Fernandez O'Halloran one of those offers you can't refuse. They had closed down their factory in Key West and moved to West Tampa. And their factory was located where today's West Tampa Public Library is located, thanks to Mr. Carnegie, who gave the money to build the West Tampa Library. If you go by West Tampa on Howard and Union and you see the library, stop a moment and read the historical markers that are there, which tie in to a lot of this. He visits with Fernando Figueredo Socarras, who tells him, hey, there's going to be a movement to create a city in West Tampa, and I might run for mayor of the city, which he does, and he wins. In any case, from West Tampa, he goes on to Ocala, and then to Jacksonville, and then October of 1894 turns out to be the last visit, the last, the 20th visit of Jose Martí. Some of us think that Jose Martí may have come back when there was a disaster called the disaster of La El Plan Fernandina. In any case, Jose Martí now has organized and they're going to be preparing the declaration of war. And Jose Martí celebrates Christmas, celebrates the new year. Now they're planning, we're going to issue the order of uprising in the next few days. Everything has been set. Three ships have been contracted. They're going to come down from Boston and New York, and they're going to come down to the Fernandina area and to Savannah. We have storage with all of the weapons and supplies waiting so that we can load them up on these three ships. Everything seems to be going just fine. Unfortunately, one of Jose Martí's trusted lieutenants 
López de Queralta, for some reason, starts shooting off his mouth that we've got supplies, we've got an expedition, we're going to be going down to Cuba, and word gets to the U.S. Customs and the Department of Justice and the Treasury Department starts paying closer attention. In the meantime, the Spanish government has hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency to be checking on this guy called Jose Marti and his followers. They then discover that these three ships in Savannah and down in Amelia Island or Fernandina may be carrying loads of weapons. U.S. Customs moves in and the three ships are embargoed and the weapons are seized. Man, if you think that Marti was having a psychological depression when his wife and his child were taken. What do I do now? I've got Antonio Mateo waiting in, um, in uh, Costa Rica. I've got uh, Maximo Gomez waiting in the Dominican Republic. Flor Crombet, Carlos Ruloff, they're all waiting. What do I tell the Maceos? What do I tell these others? How do I solve this? He then travels from New York to Fernandina under an assumed name. He quickly discovers that the seizures have taken place and his trusted buddy, his secretary, Gonzalo de Quesada, and Gonzalo's law school buddy, Horacio Rubens, both had studied law at Columbia. And this Jewish boy had really taken on the Cubans and Gonzalo de Quesada calls um, uh, Horacio Rubens. Horacio Rubens quickly comes down to Jacksonville and starts filing pleadings to get back the supplies that have been confiscated. Martí is in hiding. The last 30 days of Martí in the United States, he was in hiding. With my experience as a career prosecuting attorney, he probably disguised himself. If I were his lawyer, I would tell him, afeitate ese bigote. Get rid of that mustache. Cut your hair a little shorter. Use a derby. Change your appearance. We have no pictures of Jose Marti without a mustache. We have no pictures of Jose Marti with shorter hair. But that's Salcinas on imagination. But with my experience, this guy went into hiding, never returned to his offices of Patria, was staying with his physician in New York, celebrated his 42nd birthday, his last, and together with Maya Rodriguez and with Enrique Collazo, the three of them sign the order of uprising. And a ship has been contracted, and he leaves with his companions to meet up with Maximo Gomez in the Dominican Republic. In the meantime, he tells the Jewish lawyer, get down to Savannah, get down to Fernandina, go to Jacksonville Federal Court, see if we can retrieve some of the weaponry. Well, the Jewish lawyer, Sharp, files motions 
where he explains to the federal judiciary, hey, wait a minute, it's not illegal to possess weapons. It's not illegal to transport weapons. It's not illegal to hide weapons. So with no further proof, we want you to order all of the supplies returned to us. By golly, he wins. But in the meantime, Jose Marti is on the high seas in the Atlantic going to Dominican Republic to meet up with uh, Maximo Gomez. Something very important happens in the Dominican Republic in a little place called Monte Cristi. Together with Maximo Gomez, Marti writes out the Monte Cristi manifesto where they set the rules for a new government to govern in Cuba. Not a military dictatorship, which Jose Marti was very adamant about, but a civilian government with a strong military. But the civilian decision controlled the military. The, the uh, Manifiesto de Montecristi becomes a very important document. In the meantime, Jose Marti is there, and uh, he's got a suit. Marti always dressed very conservative, but he was uh, very cheap. He didn't, uh, in spite of raising a lot of money, not one penny that was raised for the cause of independence went to dress Marti up or for big meals or for expensive French wines. None of that. Every penny was accounted for. But Maximo Gomez uh, looks at his suit and says to Marti, Oye Marti, I think it's time for you to have another suit made. So in the Dominican Republic, Jose Marti goes to a local uh, tailor. Remember back then they didn't have ready-made clothes. You had to have your tailor make your clothes. And instead of making the typical black suit, maybe the tailor only had navy blue. But Jose Marti now gets a navy blue suit. The tailors would always tell you, you need an extra pair of pants. So if you're getting a navy blue suit, your extra pair of pants should be a medium gray. There are a few pictures of Jose Marti, always with his dark suit, white shirt, black tie, bulging mustache, but there are some pictures with a lighter color of pants. Jose Marti also was known, he's got the shiniest clothes. Shiny. Maybe he has shark skin clothes. He wore his suits for such a long time, always carrying a brush. There was no air condition, there was dust all over. The dust would get into the fibers, and Jose Marti every day would be brushing and brushing his clothes. And after a while, you brush your fibers, they start to shine. So he had shiny clothes. But when he leaves the Dominican Republic to invade Cuba, he's got a new suit. Now, he arrives in Cuba. And all of the warriors were thinking, this intellectual can't handle the jungles of Cuba. 
he can't handle the horseback riding. He can't handle the mountains and the hills. He's going to poop out. They were all shocked. Jose Marti stayed right with him. He was always a fast walker. He used to, his, his patria office was upstairs. And the report is that he just didn't take one step at a time. He was a skinny guy, and I'll give you his dimensions in a moment. But he would walk up very fast. So when he got to the jungles of Cuba, and the Mambis were, were looking at him carefully, he kept up with them, with his backpack, and with his horse. Now, his horse. He finally meets up with the big generals. And the brother of Antonio Mateo brings him a white horse. You are our president now. We're bringing you this beautiful white horse. He accepted it in good faith. We hope that it was given to him in good faith. Can you imagine being in a battlefield with a black suit on a white horse? Man, are you an easy target to knock off. And Jose Marti is shot in an area of the confluence of two rivers. That's why it's called Dos Rios, two rivers. He is shot and he is killed instantly. He had a young helper by the name of Miguel Angel de la Guardia who tries to go help the apostle, the president. But there's no way. The gunfire, the Spaniards are attacking. And so the body is left there. The Spaniards identify Jose Marti. And Jose Marti wore a ring that his mother had brought to him in New York, made out of the same metal as the chains that Jose Marti had had to wear when he was condemned to hard labor in Cuba for writing, writing some essays about independence. Jose Marti has been killed. They're not sure who this guy is, but he's not dressed like a mambi. He's dressed with a dress coat and a shirt and a tie. And he's got a ring that says Cuba. His mother had had the ring made of the same metal as the handcuffs and ankle cuffs that were used when he was in prison in Havana. And from that metal, a ring had been made with the word Cuba. We don't know where that ring ended up. We don't know if it was part of the remains that were sent to the Cuban Revolutionary Party, or maybe Gonzalo de Quesada had it among the remains of all the stuff that Martí had left and entrusted to his trusted secretary. In any case, Martí is buried there in the field and then later exhumed and taken to Santiago de Cuba. An autopsy is made and there are certain observations, like for instance, Los ojos azules, blue eyes. Everybody said he has very bright blue eyes. He was not a big man. I asked the printer, make me something that I can stand up for the conference. Martí was about 5'4". My printer only was able to get this up to five feet. 
So if you want to take your picture with Martí, lift him up when they're snapping the picture. He was a thin man. He was not a, a big man or a heavy man. I would tell you that he probably wore a small shirt. He probably had a 14 and a half collar. He probably had a 31 sleeve. He probably had a 28 or maybe 27 in inseam. He probably had a 30 waist. I bet you that guy didn't weigh 130, 135 pounds. In reading about Jose Marti and what did he like to eat, he knew good quality food, but he ate very little. And they used to say that, oh, he must drink a lot of wine. No, he did have a, a desire for some wine, but he did not consume much alcohol. His favorite soup was a minestrone soup that he had been introduced to in Europe and then in New York. He, in the Italian section, he could get sopa de minestrone. When he was a kid, since his mother was from the Canary Islands and they were poor, he probably ate a lot of gofio, okay, a lot of cornmeal which the people of uh, the Canary Islands are famous for, El Gofio. In any case, he was a connoisseur. He was a very, very intellectual individual. Now I want to tell you about a secret that nobody ever talks about Jose Martí. Very little is written on what I'm about to tell you. But I want you to pay close attention to this picture right here, Jose Martí as a prisoner, as a prisoner, and if you would, get me the visual aid over there with Jose Martí with the same picture. This is when he is serving at hard labor in the Canteras de La Habana, breaking stone and bricks. I want you to notice carefully, look at the chain that he wore. This is a chain that you wear in your waist. And when we are transporting the prisoners, these are attached. So I'm following you, you're following her. But when I get you to where you're going to have to use the, the pick or the axe, I loosen. And now you have a dangling piece of chain from your waist chain. And watch what's happening to that, uh, to that chain. The movement. The movement. He was breaking stone for six months as a result of all of the hitting and hitting in the lower testicular area, he developed small ulcers and tumors. After those six months at hard labor, through the intercession of his mother and his father, they were able to commute the five or six year sentence that he had received and he was sent to La Isla de Pinos, Island of Pines, now called uh, Isla de la Libertad or something. Juventud. What? Juventud. Isla de la Juventud, the youthful island. 
Jose Martí, even there, started having low-grade fevers. Gets to Spain, low-grade fevers. At different times, Jose Martí had to be operated on three, maybe four times, all because of the problems of that injury that he received from the chains. Even in his honeymoon, he was sick and he had fever. So here in Tampa, a number of times, Dr. Barbarossa had to come and take care of Jose Marti because of fevers. In reviewing his chronology, he missed a number of speeches and, and appearances because está enfermo. He's home. He's got fever. He's got cold sweats. They're having to summon the doctors to him. Now, as I finish my presentation to you, I told you that something very important happened in New York just before they left for the Dominican Republic. And that was La Orden de Levantamiento, the Order of Uprising. His man inside of Cuba was a mulatto intellectual by the name of Juan Gualberto Gomez. They had their code. They used to send telegrams. Nobody understood what the meaning of the telegrams were because they were coded messages. But they had to get an order signed by the leaders to the hands of Juan Gualberto Gomez because these leaders are outside of Cuba. Juan Gualberto Gomez knows who the leaders inside of Cuba. So there's got to be a simultaneous, coordinated, military, synchronized uprising inside, and then the troops with the supplies are coming in from elsewhere. The order is signed. Gonzalo de Quesada, who eventually would become the first ambassador to the United States of the new Republic of Cuba, was Martí's trusted secretary. And when the three leaders signed, Gonzalo, lleva esto pa Westampa. Take this to West Tampa. Give it to Fernando Figueredo Socarras in the Fernandez O'Halloran factory in West Tampa, where the library is now located. We've got to smuggle it into Cuba. He will know how to disguise it. Take it once he does what he has to do with it. Take it to Key West. Gonzalo de Quesada's brother-in-law, Miguel Ángel Duque de Estrada, will be there and he will can carry it to Cuba on one of the ferries and hand it to Juan Gualberto Gómez. Gonzalo de Quesada comes to West Tampa. The Jewish lawyer, Horacio Rubens, stays in Jacksonville to try to get the weapons and material returned. He goes to see Fernando Figueredo. This is what Martí sends. He looks at the three signatures and he says, let's go over to the factory. So they go to the cigar factory where the library is now. And he goes to his boss. Fernando Figueredo was the bookkeeper of the factory. And he tells the boss, Blas Fernández O'Halloran, Oye, méteme esto. 
en un tabaco. Get this into a cigar. Fernandez O'Halloran examines, folds it. How the hell do I do this? What do I do that? How do I get this to fit in a cigar? But he ingeniously rolls the cigar, rolls the paper into a cigar. And the last cap that they used to cover had a little white dot so that they could identify the cigar that had la orden de levantamiento. He then made three identical cigars so that it'll all look legit. Oops, excuse me. Okay? Says goodbye, goes to Port Tampa, gets on the Olivet or the Mascot or the Hutchinson, goes to Key West, walks up to Miguel Ángel Duque de Estrada and says, this cigar has the order of uprising. You got to take it to Havana and give it to Juan Gualberto Gomez. If the Spanish customs challenge you, if you have to eat the mother, you eat it. <laughs> but don't let the Spaniards discover the order that's in here. He gets on the ship, goes to uh, Havana, goes through customs, goes to see Juan Gualberto Gomez. Uh, mire, le mandan esto. So he takes out his pocket knife, opens his pocket knife, and then proceeds to do an autopsy <laughs> of the cigar. And when he opens the cigar, the order of uprising is there. Did you all see my autopsy? Juan Gualberto Gomez reads the instructions. It doesn't give him the exact date to start the War of Independence. It just says you got to decide what date you want to use during the last two weeks of the month of February. But, like those of you with military experience, we can't have Oriente, uprising, and Pinal del Rio not doing anything. We can't have Havana province uprise without Las Villas. It has to be coordinated so that it is simultaneous and synchronized so that all six provinces all uprise at the same time. That order was given. Juan Gualberto Gomez decided it's going to be on a Sunday, the 24th of February. Big patriotic day in Cuba. El 24 de febrero in the six provinces that existed then. The uprising started and the Cuban War of 1895, also known as the Martí War, got on. It went on. A number of Martí's closest military confidants were killed during the war. Flor Crombet was killed even before Martí. And then others were killed, including Serafín Sánchez, who Martí trusted so much, and many others. But some survived, like 
Carlos Ruloff. Juan Gualberto Gómez had been deported for his activities and he had been sent to North Africa where Spain has a colony called Ceuta. In any case, in 1898, the United States sent the Maine to Havana to protect the American citizens that were in Havana. The boat mysteriously exploded. The Americans blamed the Spaniards. The Spaniards blamed the Cubans. The Spaniards assured the American government we had nothing to do with the explosion of the Maine. Spain went on to say, we will pay in solid gold all of the value of the Maine and the men that were killed. We had nothing to do with it. But in New York, Mr. Hurst was rolling the drums and the, the cry was, remember the main and to hell with Spain. Before you know it in the United States, a, a, a craze took over. Congress declared war on uh, Spain and Tampa became a key point of 30,000 soldiers that were stationed right here where you are today in the old Tampa Bay Hotel and the surrounding uh, land. It was here that Teddy Roosevelt had organized a volunteer group that he headed up. Of course, he went down and he became famous in the same area of where Jose Marti, three years before, in that confluence of the two rivers, where Jose Marti had been killed. Of course, Spain quickly surrendered. As you will hear from uh, Dr. Gary Mormino, he refers to that war as the splendid little war because in a matter of 60 or 90 days, the United States became an international power and it acquired Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, and the Mariana Islands. Some are still part of our commonwealth. In any case, fast forward. The nuclear submarine history had just been written and Admiral Rickover, about 1955, 1956, I don't remember exactly, Congress set up an investigative committee. Let's find out the real reason for the explosion of the main. And Admiral Rickover, the father of the Nautilus, our first nuclear submarine, was the chairman of that invest congressional investigating committee. And at the end of many reports and many uh, reviews of documents, they came to the conclusion that the Spaniards had nothing to do with the explosion of the Maine. The Cubans had nothing to do with the explosion of the Maine. The explosion of the Maine had been an engineering design mistake because they put all of the charcoal that was needed for the steam for the ship to move in the very first compartment. And in the second compartment, all of the munitions Coal has a natural tendency of instant lighting itself, instant combustion. That's exactly what happened and what was next to the combustion, the munitions, 
they exploded and the main didn't go down from an explosion in the back of the ship, but it exploded in the front and a lot of our uh, sailors were killed. I've been given the cut sign telling me in very clear Cuban language, <laughs> you're taking too long. So I must tell you that if Jose Marti would have lived maybe 20 or 30 or 40 years later, he would have been a recipient of a Nobel Prize and a Pulitzer Prize. He doesn't belong to Cuba. He belongs to all of the Americas. He lived in our country 15 years. He lived in his own country 16 years. He died at 42. He visited many other countries. So he was just as much part of the United States as he is part of Cuba. Jose Marti was one of those extraordinary figures. Someone once wrote, some men never die. Jose Marti is one of those intellectuals that lives today. And Tampa is very proud that Jose Marti lived here the last three years of his life. His pueblo fiel never has forgotten Jose Marti. We have a street in Palmasia called Marti. We have El Parque de Jose Marti. We have um, the, the bust of Jose Marti in front of the Cuban club and in the Club Cívico Cubano. We have a beautiful stand-up statue in the Parque de Jose Marti. We have at least 10 or 15 historical markers all concerning Jose Marti. He is part of Tampa. And I submit to you, Tampa is a part of Jose Marti. Thank you very much. Wow. My mother thanks you. My sister thanks you. My father thanks you, and I thank you. I'm very pleased. I told you that Jose Marti visited many of our cigar uh, factories. And as I look up, I see Ariel Quintela sitting back there very quiet. Ariel Quintela, together with another partner, took the only wooden cigar factory that is left in Tampa and have spent a lot of money, as we say in West Tampa, mucho money, <laughs> in refurbishing the old Evaristo Monet, M-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, factory, where Jose Marti went and spoke on at least three different times. And if you go to Ybor City and you go on Palm Avenue, right behind Centennial Park and the Ybor City Museum, there is a three-story, very white uh, uh, wood frame cigar factory that are now apartments, thanks to him and his partner who have saved the last remaining wooden cigar factory in Tampa where Marti visited. So thank you for what you all have done. <laughs>